Glad to see you this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Now, if you're going to get stuck in a chapter of the Bible, which we seems like we have, uh, Revelation 19 is not a bad place to get stuck. So much material uh, that's laid out here. In looking at the Word of God, the entire Bible is the Word of God. Some parts of the Bible will mean more to us than others because they relate to us directly. Psalm 23 is a very key passage of Scripture for us. John 3, 16. But sometimes the, what I would say, the hidden pages of the Bible, those that are overlooked because we scanned it too fast, or that we were told to stay out of that portion of the Bible. Uh, I'm not sure many of you have given great six-month study of the book of Deuteronomy. However, I was called in days gone by to go to a college in, uh, in Virginia and teach in one week the entire book of Deuteronomy. Uh, what a challenge that was. But what I found was Deuteronomy is a great book of the Bible. And oftentimes people are pushed away from the book of Revelation. But it's the only book of the Bible that God says that you're blessed if you read it, if you hear it read to you, or if you practice the truths there are therein. And so I'm glad that we've, <laughs> it's amazing how time quickly flies. And um, uh, we've spent now two years and a quarter on the book of Revelation. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad that it's been recorded because when we're taken up, at least it'll be there for the rest of the world to be warned uh, in, in uh, our absence so our testimony can go on. Very interesting portion of scripture that we're going to we're going to study today. This chapter is a chapter that deals with voices. There are seven voices in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. The first voice is the voice of the saints. And that's found in verses 1 to 3. The second is the voice of the 24 elders and the four beasts, found in verse 4. And then out of, the voice out of the throne is in verse 5. We certainly have spent a, long, a, long, a little bit of time, a long time maybe, uh, on, the, on the fourth voice, and that was of the great multitude in heaven. And for just a, just a little bit, John's attention, the Apostle John's attention is moved from what's going to happen on the earth to what's going to happen in heaven. And he views the judgment seat of Christ, he views the marriage of the Lamb, and he views, as we did last week, the marriage supper of the Lamb in verses 6 to 9. 
Now we pick up our study in verse number 10. And it's the voice of the one not to be worshipped. It's the voice of the one not to be worshipped. I think, I think John, in this verse, got carried away. He'd been seeing the glories of the seven years in heaven. The judgment seat of Christ, where God's people are rewarded. And, and that's going to be a blessed time, especially in the fact when we see people that were overlooked here will be recognized there. And then he saw the marriage of the Lamb. What a, mar what a wonderful ceremony that's going to be. And we'll be indwelt with Christ personally. I've seen the Lord Jesus in my mind's eye. I've had the privilege of going to Israel seven times and get a little bit of an idea of what the people from Nazareth look like. And I have a picture of Jesus in my mind, but I've never seen him in reality. But then not only will I see him, but I will be reunited with him in a marriage bond for eternity. What a glorious thing that's going to be. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb. I was uh, getting my menu this week, getting all set out for, for the marriage of the Lamb. But uh, here we go. And so John, I think, is sort of raptured in the moment. He's sort of, uh, he, he loses his moorings for just a moment because he's brought back down to earth. Do you ever get like that? Where something's so good, you say, boy, I wish this would last forever. And then all of a sudden, you got to come back to reality. Well, that's what John did. In verse 10, it says, And I fell at, the, at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We are reminded right here in the 19th chapter of Revelation that we should not worship anybody but Jesus. Anyone. Now, you understand that includes God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, but because they're God, but we focus on Jesus. We focus on Jesus. He is our Savior. He is our fellow mate. He is the one that died on the cross for us. And so we have to be careful. And so uh, he, he got so enraptured by what was going on that the one that was speaking, the one member out of the throne, that he fell at his feet and began to worship him. I think that happens sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, children will get wrapped up in their dad. Dad is my hero. Dad is, you know, every... But understand that Jesus comes before dad. We all love our mothers. There's they're just something special about that. In fact... In, in my time as I was getting older, uh, and I was in Texas, my parents were in Indiana, and I would call my dad, uh, he was a fighter pilot in World War II, lost a lot of his hearing, and so he couldn't necessarily, uh, they had it, he had hearing aids, but most of the time in family dis discussions, he turned them off. And um, I asked him why, he said it's better that way. And, um, and so, but I would call and I'd talk to my mom and tell her, you, we'd talk, you know, for half an hour, 45 minutes, and I'd tell her all the stuff, and then she would tell, tell my dad uh, with her interpretation. And, uh, and so he kept up that way. But I, I love my dad, I love my mom, and moms are always so special. Just so special. And I have great admiration for 
ladies that have to raise their children alone. I do. It's not, that's not God's plan. But it is God's permissive will. And I thank God for every woman without a husband will raise a godly man who has the morals that he should and the character that he should and the integrity that he should. We admire them. Sometimes people get enamored by a pastor. Well, I want to tell you, I'm nothing, I am nothing to admire. Just be honest with you. Hey, if God has used me in your life, be thankful for that, but leave it at that. I don't want to be put on a pedestal because you know what? It hurts me more when I fall than it hurts you, believe it or not. I'm just an old sinner that's saved by grace. And Bill, thank you for that song this morning. Because my, how wonderful it is that our sins have been buried in the deepest sea. They've been moved from as far as the east is from the west. And by the way, there is no meeting point there. And God said that he forgets us. Our, they're lost in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Boy, I'm glad about that. I'm glad that I go to heaven and God's going to strip off of me my old flesh my old man, everything that's bad about me, and I'll walk in his righteousness and not my own. Because you know what? I don't have any other than Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And never take them off. I don't care if it's an angel. I don't care if it's a dad. I don't care if it's a mom. I don't care if it's a preacher. I don't care if it's anybody. And for goodness sake, don't worship somebody other than Jesus. Nobody can get you to heaven other than Jesus. And so we, we see here that he fell at his feet to worship the voice, and he said, don't do that. John, the apostle, should have known better. But he was caught up in the moment. He was caught up in a moment of worship, and he fell at an angel's feet. And the angel said, whoa, 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 don't do that. He said, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. By the way, this is the, this is, and, and again, I think sometimes we have to be careful with the book of Revelation, the title, only because of the fact that some people call it the, the revelations. It's not revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is all about Jesus. It's not about the horrors of the, uh, the uh, tribulation and the great tribulation. It is the revelation. And revelation means previously hidden truth now revealed. That's exactly what it means. And so what we find here, we find that little by little through this book, God is revealing Jesus. And so he said, keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't get sidetracked. Don't look over here. Don't look over there. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you'll do that, I'm going to tell you, life not only will be better, but eternity will be better. Now, the, the next is, and we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time here, but this is the, this is the sixth voice. And it's it's a voice of silence over the phenomenal Christ. It's a voice of silence over the phenomenal Christ. Now, there are two visions of Jesus in the book of Revelation. One is in chapter 1, where we see the glory of Christ. 
And then in verse 19, we see the magnificence and the, and the uh, phenomenal vision of Christ the warrior. The warrior. And here it is. I wish somebody would come out with, a, uh, with a, uh, an action figure of Jesus in his, all of his glory. But here it is. In verses 11 through 16, it says this, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. Sometimes somebody asks me, are there animals in heaven? Yes, there are. I mean, it's right here. At least there's, at least there's white horses in heaven. And I'm de I've decided my puppy dog's going to be there. I mean, I had time where, where I, I gave her the gospel and... Oh. And I said, is that what you want? And I took her head and said, yes, yes. <laughs> hey, listen. Heaven is going to be heaven. And I believe with all my heart that heaven is going to be heaven, but it's going to be enough like earth that we're not going to be in zombie land. We're not going to be in uh, some kind of weird experience it is, it is just the, our life after life. And it's going to be free from sin, free from all the things we're going to talk about in the next chapter. But it, it is a glorious, wonderful place where we're going to be with the Lord and each other. And so it, it says... And the armies which were in heaven followed him on, upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of his fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath it on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is our Savior. Now let's, let's look at that. Let's look at that for just a second. And, and, and again, I, I have a very um, vivid mind. I, I try to see things. I... Because, again, and it's, I often say that we have to understand that when we hear a, a, a word, we associate with a picture in our mind. If I say elephant, all of us have seen an elephant. If I say kangaroo, what do we see? We see a kangaroo. And so there's this, this vision for, between us that God wants his word to become visual to us. So when he writes the word of God, if we allow ourselves, and I'm not talking about, uh, there's not enough time, a lot of times in church, for us to totally visualize the Lord. I would encourage you this week to sit down with this, this particular passage of scripture. And let your mind, get in your mind, take the time, 
for you to see our coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you've already done that, do it again, because he's coming. In fact, all of the world's situation is coming. The earth is showing that it's coming to an end. And unfortunately, we got folks in, in Washington that are trying to make it an end for us in America. I don't know all that that means for us, but the truth is that this world is going to pass away completely. And we better get ourselves ready for heaven. So let's, let's look at it. John sees heaven open, and I saw heaven open. Okay, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we, John is, is now, he's been rebuked. He's been, he's told, no, you don't, you don't bow down to me. You bow down only to Jesus. Now, let me give you a picture of Jesus, John. And behold, there's a white horse there. That'll catch your attention. Beautiful horses. Beautiful, white, glorious horses. In fact, they're so magnificent that they can make the journey from heaven to earth. You don't need uh, one of the giants of the earth to have a, a, you know, a rocket ship go up and get a horse and then bring it back down. You don't have that. This horse makes it all on his own. And he that sat upon him was called, and I love this, faithful and true. You'll never find a spot or a blemish on Jesus. It's not there. See, Jesus, even when he was on earth, was tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Jesus never did anything wrong, but he never didn't do that which was right. And as hard as we try, we may get down all the stuff you're not supposed to do in our life, but sometimes we don't get what we should be doing right in our life. But Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God revealing to us the Son of God. And then it goes, he, because he's faithful and he's true. And in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And I, I want you to understand that what's going to be happening in the next couple of verses, I want you to understand that the Bible says it's in righteousness that he doth judge and make war. You know, sometimes we, we think, well, what about when we get to heaven and we see a friend there that... That, 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 that we love, or a relative that we love and that, goes to, and that goes to hell. Is God unrighteous for sending that person to hell? I'll tell you what I'm going to think. I'm going to think, well, I should have tried harder to get that person saved. I should have prayed more for that person. I should have asked God to break the, his will. But I want you to understand, as I said last week about the, the, the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb, the only people not there are the people that decided not to go. And I want you to understand that someone's salvation is not up to me. Someone's salvation is up to them. I can only preach. I can only share my heart. I can only let you know that I care. I only can to let you know that I want you to be saved and go to heaven and be there with us forever. <laughs> but it is not my decision. If it were my decision, everybody that I ever preached to through the years would be saved. My requirement is to let them know. As in Ezekiel, I'll find that, it might, that their blood is not on my hand. Your responsibility is to your family to tell them about Jesus so their blood is not on your hands. 
your responsibility to those at work are for you to let them know about salvation. You can't make them get saved, but you can tell them how to get saved. He's going to judge and make war. His eyes, can you see it? Those eyes that are going to look straight through a person. Even though you see a multitude of people, Jesus sees it all at once. And he knows everything about everybody. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. You see, Jesus now is not a little baby in a manger. He's not going from place to place doing good and healing people. He's not now hanging on a cross. He's not now being taken down from the cross. He's not now being put in a, in a being washed and cleaned and anointed for burial and, and put in the, the, the death cloth. He's not now inside a tomb whereby the, 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 uh, the stone was rolled there. He's now the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is now the greatest warrior that has ever been seen. Greater than Goliath. Greater than David. Greater than any, any warrior has ever seen. He is the greatest. Why? Because he's the king of all kings. He is the lord of all all lords. And then it goes on and it, and it tells us and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Isn't that interesting? There's some things that God holds back. When's Jesus coming? What's the date of his coming? We don't know. When I was pastoring the last church I was in we had, a, I don't know, Lois, if you remember the, the, the gentleman, but he got so, ex he, he had studied some, uh, some Jewish philosopher and some Jewish knowledge, and he had it figured out when Jesus, the date that Jesus was coming. And so when I would stand at the door, when I could stand, uh, I stood at the door and shook hands with people when they went out of the door. And, uh, and, and so that whole year, he told me, I, I know the date when Jesus is coming. I said, well, the Bible says that we can't know. He said, I, I, but I know, I know, I know. And so as the time got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, he'd come, you know, only four more Sundays. We won't be here. Only three more Sundays, we won't be here. Only two more Sundays, we won't be here. And he said, I won't see you next week because Jesus is coming this week. I said, I sure hope you're, tr it's, you're right, but I don't think you are. Well, Jesus didn't come, and he never came back. So, um, but I tried, to, I tried to talk to him so that he wouldn't just run away, but he'd learn a truth. Don't guess. You'll never know. And you say, well, preacher, what is that now? What is, it, what, what is his name there? What does that mean? I don't know. I mean, shouldn't preachers be honest enough to say, if we don't know, we don't know? And if, I, I mean, I'll tell you, if I, I can give you some mythology along the way, but, you know, it, that's only my opinion. But if the Bible says it, it's true. If the Bible doesn't say it or tells us he, nobody knows it, guess what? Nobody knows it. And so it says this, and, and uh, then it goes on, that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Now, why, why is Jesus coming? Now, now, follow with me very careful. Jesus is coming back this time, this, in this 19th chapter, to avenge 
his death. He is God's messenger to avenge his death. Oh, you say, well, preacher, man, I, hey, I wasn't even alive when Jesus died on the cross. Uh, yeah, but he, you are going to either have accepted what Jesus did on the cross or rejected what Jesus did on the cross. And if you're alive when Jesus comes back again, guess what? He will avenge his death on the lost. And the blood is a reminder of why he's coming. And his name is called the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? The Word of God. Why did it say the Word of God? It says the Word of God because you see what's going to happen is going to come as a result of the Word of God. Do you know who created this world? Now, now be real careful now. Well, God created, no. Not God the Father. Not God the Holy Spirit. But Jesus created this world. He spoke the word of God, and it became truth. He created the heavens and the earth. He created light. He created separation from the earth and the water. He created the animals. He created it all. Man, woman, everything good in this earth, even to today, anything that's good comes from God. Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Lord. You get a pay raise? Hey, I'm going to tell you, God did that. You say, well, I, I've never been saved, but I've got a raise, so why should I praise God? Because it rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. And you know, God's such a good God, sometimes... He rewards the unrighteous. Isn't that something? You know, I, I, I just don't like a preacher that preaches about hell. Well, you know what? It's there. I don't think we ought to beat people with hell. But I, we need to understand that it's there. And if you reject Christ, that's where you're going to spend eternity. A lot of people got saved because they re recognized that they did not want to go to hell. But I understand that salvation is a lot more than just not going to hell. It's not a card you stick in your, in your pocket and say, well, hey, man, I'm all set now because I ain't going to hell. I can live any way I want. No, if you really get saved, you can't live any way you want. Because God changes your nature. He changes everything about you. So then it goes ahead and it says, and, and by the way, everything he's going to do in these next couple of verses is based on that. He, it's, it, he is the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Yay. You know, I told Ruthie that a long time ago that if I weren't a preacher, I'd be a farmer. That's, I, that's what I'd really like. You wake up, you're at, you're at work. No travel time. You're just right there. And, and the people you work with, the chickens and the cows and the horses, they can't talk back to you. And most of my relatives were farmers. And sometimes I'll, I'll see, you know, a picture of a... And, and you know, most farm men, and I don't know, yeah, this may be just true in my family, they were quiet. They, they, they just didn't talk much. But when they did, you needed to listen. Good old farmers got up, did their job, came in, had a delicious meal, went back out, worked till, till dusk, came back in, had a snack, went to bed, did it again, did it again, did it again. That's when we had 
the foundation of this great country. And people who were willing to do their job and stand for the truth. Then we see that we're clothed. It's interesting that Jesus has blood around the bottom of his, of his robe. But look what it says about us. We're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you, do you, know, do you know the only what we would call imperfect person in heaven will be Jesus? He has blood on his vesture, but you know what? If he holds up his hands, you're going to see what the disciples saw. You're going to see the nail prints in his hands. If he opens his vesture, you're going to see where the, where the spear went into his side and outflowed out of his heart, blood and water. You're going to see his feet that still have the nail prints. When you see me, you're going to see someone that's perfect, that's, that's in white linen and clean and pure. I will have no sin. Jesus will have no sin, but he will have the marks of what it took to take sin away. As a reminder, every time we get around Jesus, of how wonderful he is and how sinful we've been. Jesus. There is something about that name, isn't there? Amen. Then it goes on and it says, and out of his mouth, here it comes, is a sharp sword. What is that? The word of God. You see, the word of God is capable of cutting between the soul and the spirit. It's the only thing that can do that. The word of God. You see, the Word of God is not only creative, the Word of God is separative. That will, with it, he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of his fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Now, if I go back for just a second, um, yeah, back to chapter 16 and, and verse 20, we, we understand this next. Because it says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, the word of God, with it he shall, which should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a the rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of his fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're, we're talking about the end, the end of the Battle of Armageddon. And the Battle of Armageddon is going to be fought in a valley called Megiddo. And in that, it's got mountains all the way around and, and forms a bowl. And the Bible says that when everything is said and done at the end of the, the end, and, the, and this will set it for next week. I, I'm, I'm got to wrap it up with this today to stay within our time limit. You see, if I don't stay in the time limit, there's a, there's a little hole here that I just disappear. Yeah, where'd he go? But what happens here is all the nations of the world that have received the mark of the beast come into the valley of Megiddo. It's really interesting. The two major principles are Russia and China. Oh, my goodness. I wonder when that's going to happen. Yes. Russia and China. Do, do, you until, do you know that until just real recently, Russia and China have not had anything to do with each other? In fact, have been at odds with each other? 
but not now. And so we see this coming together. And so they, China comes for, is a nation from the east. Russia comes down. Turkey's involved. Iran is involved. Persia's involved. And all these nations come together. And they all meet in this valley of Megiddo where multitude of battles were fought. And, and you say, well, OK, that, that's fine, because you, people are going to be slaughtered there. Understand? They're going to be slaughtered there. This is the end of the tribulation. This is the people who would not receive them, or who received the mark of the beast. And you say, well, how is it possible for there being enough blood to fill up to the horse's bridle? I mean, that's pretty high. How is there going to be enough blood to do that? Okay, now I have no doubt that that's capable. But what's going to happen is when Jesus, when he judges with his mouth and the word of God, which is going to be magnificently powerful, and when these are all destroyed, it will be like a wine press. Well, you said, well, where's the press going to come from? Here it is, Revelation 16. And it talks about the seventh vial. In verse 21, it says, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone, the weight of a talent. Now, the talent weighed about 75 pounds. 75 pounds. Now we've had, in our area, we've had hail that was what? Golf ball, a little bit bigger, softball sometimes. Can you imagine heaven opening up and there being 75 pound hailstones coming down on people that have been wiped out by the word of God. You've got the melting of water and the mixing of blood from being just smushed, wine pressed, pressed down. And it will fill that mighty valley hold it, held, held in by the mountains that surround it. And the blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle. And he hath on his vesture and he goes back, he says, treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Battle of Armageddon will be the greatest battle ever won in the history of the world. You say, well, are we going to fight with Jesus when we go down? No. We're going to watch. And we're going to watch the power of the Word of God. Jesus spoke the worlds into existence. I love when scientists say, well, we found more, we found more, we found more, we found, well, dummy, read the story of Abraham, and God said that Abraham would have more, more <laughs> his, his children will be like the stars of the heaven, the great, great of the, uh, the, the sand of the seashore. They're innumerable. This will be an awful time. But Jesus brought the world in by the word of God, and he's going to take the world out by the word of God. Is he really the king of kings and lord of lords? Absolutely. And they can, huh, who, who is it? Uh, 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 Ronald Reagan, you know, who's, who's Ronald Reagan's son. 
you know, he'll get on the TV every once in a while. He said, I'm the head of uh, this atheist union. And he said, I'm, I'm against all this Christianity and all this other religion messing around with politics. You know, and I want to say, you know, the only reason you have a nation that you have with the politics you have is because of the word of God. Because our nation was formed and set on the principles of the word of God. Now, did our people mess up along the way? Absolutely they did. Because they were sinners, not much Christian. But let me tell you something. The basic fundamentals of our government must be set, or in a family, or in an individual, must be set on the principles of the word of God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Wow. We can go home today saying, thank God. I know him. And I'm going to ride with him. And I'm going to see the power of Almighty God when God says, I'm going to avenge what the world has done to my son, Jesus. He rules in righteousness. If we have relatives that are not saved, we need to quickly tell them. If we have friends that are not saved, we need to quickly tr try to get the gospel to them. If we have those that we love, we need to quickly tell them about Jesus. May God help us to be the Christians and the testimony we need to be. So when we see these things, we can say to the Lord, I did my best. And we can look at our hands. And there's no blood. Oh, there will be some blood, I know. But there's no blood because I tried to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. I feel sorry for the preachers that their arms are dripping in blood because they've never at one time shared the gospel of Jesus with others. Let's pray.